great job last week. And I keep thinking, I guess this is only the second Sunday in January, in December, isn't it? I'm trying to get ahead of myself. Third. This is the third? Okay, this is the third Sunday. I, 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 I'm trying to figure it all out. Are you, like, are you that way? I finally bought some Christmas gifts last night. Anybody else, you know, still, still doing Christmas shopping? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's not that we don't uh, want to do it, it's just what to do and, and uh, different things like that and we get doing other things. And my tendency is to just uh, take a card and put something, you know, money in it, whatever, and hand it to my kids because they're adults now. Uh, and then every now and then something will come and say, you know, they could really use that. Even though they won't ask for it, they could use it. And Dad knows. <laughs> so so, so I, uh, I, I had something like that come across my mind this last week, and so I, I decided to uh, go and, uh, and get the, that on my way home last night from the wild party we were at uh, with the sunshine class. But... Uh, so, so I've got to do that. I've still got more to do. I think about Christmas, and I don't know about you, but one word I associate with Christmas quite often is that word joy. Joy. There was joy for us growing up with our family when we gathered together. Uh, there was joy in the church family when we got together. Uh, joy. Now, I understand there's those other words, you know, hectic, uh, uh, busy, swamped, uh, you know, tired. I understand all those other words. But joy keeps coming back when I think of Christmas in the proper sense. And I think of Scripture, and as I've already told you, the word joy is used over 240 times. And if you add rejoicing, if you add joyful, it, it's even more. One of my favorite passages of Scripture in relation to that is found in Philippians, the fourth chapter, where it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say rejoice. How are you doing at that this Christmas season? Are you rejoicing in the Lord always? The rest of that passage, the next couple of verses are pretty awesome. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, even the cooking. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. I'm afraid sometimes we forget to be joyful in church. You've probably heard the story. But there's a story about a little boy, oh, a toddler. He was probably three years old or so. His mom was brave enough that she sat up front. And the toddler was there. And one Sunday, he was in the pew and he was kind of walking back and forth across the pew. You know how a toddler will do. But he was looking back at those behind him. And he was just smiling. Oh, smiling. Oh, so happy. That the people behind him, the adults, they couldn't help but kind of smile back, you know. And, and, and it just kind of made them, you know, happy and, and joyful. You know, and, and they're smiling back at him. He's going back and forth and, and, and being a little distracting, but he's not, you know, he's not tearing up a hill no. He's not, you know, doing anything drastic. He's not yelling out in church or anything like that. He's just smiling as big as he can. Finally, his mom next to him realizes what he's doing. She grabs him, turns around, sets him down and says, you're not supposed to do that in church. And she swats him on the bottom. And tears start to come down his face, and she says, now that's how you're supposed to act in church. And sometimes I think we get that feeling, you know, how we're supposed to act in church. We can't be joyful. We have to be solemn. We have to be tears. And, and, and I understand there's times we come to church that way, with issues going on. But joy should be a characteristic that we have as Christians. Uh, that first Christmas, 
Luke's Gospel, and we shared last week the, the Christmas story out of Luke's Gospel. But let me go back to part of it again, Luke chapter 2, verse 10. It says, But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Isn't it interesting? The first thing the angels have to do is say, don't be afraid. <laughs> uh, when the angels of the Lord appear, it's interesting how many times their first words are, don't be afraid. What crosses my mind is when we see the awesomeness of God, sometimes we need to remind ourselves, we do not have to be afraid of our God. He is a loving God who cares for us and wants to work in our lives for our good. And if we will listen to Him and be obedient to Him, it shouldn't be something that causes us fear when we know His presence. But it should bring joy. But why were they saying great joy? What was it that was bringing this joy? You know we know the Christmas story. It was the fact that God had come as a babe in a manger. The fact that Jesus had been born. Now, I understand the virgin birth is awesome. It is an awesome miracle of God. But can I tell you one that I think is even better? And that is the fact that God decided to dwell among us. That God became man. Now theologically, I can't lay it all out for you perfectly. But this I know from scripture. That Jesus was born, he was fully God, and he was fully man. I can't shortchange either one of those. And I don't want to. But we need to remember, fully God, fully man. God incarnate. God with us. And Christmas is when God came to dwell with us, to be amongst us. Scripture, because of that, talks about the joy of the Christmas story. It's interesting. Luke chapter 1, verse 14. Zechariah was told by the angel, You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. Luke chapter 1, verse 44. John the Baptist leaped for joy in his mother's womb. Oh, I could go off on a tangent here. A baby in a womb, leaping for joy. Hmm. Uh, that says a lot that maybe we need to be reminded of uh, in our day and age. But anyway, let me, let me go on. The 47th verse of that same first chapter. Mary rejoiced in God her Savior. Luke 1, 58. They were rejoicing with Elizabeth. Luke 2, 10 that I've already read to you. Good tidings of great joy will be to all people. Joy. God coming to dwell with us. Charles Spurgeon said, It was God taking upon himself human nature, a wondrous mystery to be believed in rather than defined. Yet so it was that in the manger lay an infant who was also infinite, a feeble child who was also the creator of heaven and earth. Wow. God with us. And of course, one of the names for Jesus is that which we sing these Sundays during the Advent season. Emmanuel. Emmanuel. God with us. He rejoiced 
because God was coming to dwell amongst us. They rejoiced because God is now not only with us, but he is here as Savior, providing a way for us back to God the Father. He came, what, to redeem sinful man, us, so that we might have a way back to God the Father. He fulfills the hope that we talked about the first Sunday of Advent, the hope that the Israelites had in a Messiah, in one who was coming to deliver them, Jesus Emmanuel, the hope of the world. They rejoiced in the fact that he came not to some palace, not to some place where only a few people could get to him, but he came as a babe in a manger. The most common place possible. He came to dwell among us and to be with us to where all of us can touch him. All of us can reach out to him. He came in lowliness, not as a king in royal robes, but again as a babe. Oh, I hope this Christmas season you rejoice in the fact that Jesus Christ came, God the Son, to dwell among us. But as I think about that, I think, okay, who should have this joy? Who, who should, you know, enjoy the fact that Jesus has come? And evidently, first of all, it's the angels. And isn't it interesting? Even though he didn't come for the angels, yet they are rejoicing in God's plan of salvation. They know that God the Almighty is doing something awesome. And so they're rejoicing in that. Who else rejoiced? The shepherds. It's kind of interesting when you read the Christmas story and you read about the shepherds. I don't read any place that they doubted. Have you found it? Uh, the scripture says when the angels had gone away, that they turned to one another and says, let us go and see what's happened. And they rejoiced in what God was doing. So those who should be rejoicing, the, the shepherd, the angels, the shepherds, really those who should be rejoicing are those who know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We have great reason to rejoice. God loves us so much, cares about us so much, that he worked out a perfect plan of salvation for us. And that plan was sending Jesus into the world as a babe in a manger. Wow! Christians, we should be joyful. We shouldn't always have to sit in church with tears in our eyes, having been spanked by mom. You know, we, we shouldn't always be in church sad and sullen. I understand, again, there are times we go through great battles and great struggles. Thank goodness we can come to church, and during those times we can find solace, and we can find help and support from brothers and sisters in Christ. But there should be times that we come rejoicing, praising God, thanking Him for what He has done, for what He is doing, and for what He is yet going to do. But we are still a people of hope, right? Yes. So if we are to be rejoicing, how do we do it? What do we do? How do you rejoice when life's been rough? How do you rejoice when life's been difficult? <laughs> how do you rejoice when you feel like Chirpy? You ever heard the story about Chirpy? Chirpy was a little parakeet, you know, that uh, was in a cage in its home, and he always used to sing and always used to seem to be a happy parakeet. 
except one day his owner was cleaning the house and using the vacuum and decided to clean out the back, the bottom of his cage. And the phone rang. And as she reached for the phone, she, you know, did that stretch type of thing with the vacuum and lifted the vacuum up and got chirpy. And fortunately, it wasn't one of these newfangled vacuums, you know, with the, with the uh, bagless container. It, it had the bag in it and everything. And Chirpy went through to the bag. <laughs> and when she realized what she had done in, in horror, you know, she turns off the vacuum, she throws down the phone, she zips open the bag and pulls out and Chirpy's still alive, which is amazing in itself. You know, and she looks at Chirpy and it's all dusty and dirty from being in the bag. And so the first thing she does is she runs into the bathroom, turns on the faucet at the tub, and sticks Chirpy underneath the water. And gets Chirpy good and clean, and then she realizes that Chirpy's all wet, and she says, Oh no, what have I done? And she goes and takes Chirpy over to the sink and to where her hair dryer is. And she takes the hair dryer and gets Chirpy all nice and clean and dry, and puts Chirpy back in its cage, but then wonders why Chirpy doesn't sing much. <laughs> Yes, I understand. Sometimes that feels like life. Amen? Sometimes it feels like you've been drugged through the dirt, you've been dunked, and then you've been blown away. But in the midst of all that, we have a Savior in Jesus Christ who knows us, who knows what we're going through, who knows the dirt, who knows the floods that are coming upon us, who knows the storms. And he is working in our lives and in our situations if we but surrender to him. And so, how should we respond to that? How should we exhibit joy in the midst of that? I think one of the things we need to do is make sure that others know that even though we're going through storms, even though we're going through battles, through difficulties, we can have a joy in our heart because we know a Savior who is working on our behalf. Right. We know that God loves us. He cares about us. And he's working in our situations. Even though at times I do wonder, and I'm sure you do wonder, okay, Lord, how are you working in this? How are you going to work it out? And he does it in his time, and he does it in his way. The Psalms talks about trusting in the Lord. Proverbs, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understandings, right? In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct our paths. We trust in him. And so, we hopefully share that with others. We share joy, not frustration, at, at Christmas. We praise the Lord during the Christmas season. Even while others around us are pulling their hair out and, you know, are, are, are just hectically trying to figure everything out. We rejoice that we can praise God for what he has done by sending the babe in the manger. Because that's the real reason of Christmas. It's not family, although family is important. It's not giving gifts. It's not even giving gifts. I don't know about you, I enjoy giving gifts more than I enjoy getting them. Amen. Becky will tell you all sorts of stories about how I cannot wait to give gifts until Christmas. <laughs> if I get them, she has to keep reminding me I can't give it until Christmas whenever we get together as family. Because I'll give it away early and then I'll go get something else to give away on Christmas Day. <laughs> you know, that's just the way I am. I, I enjoy doing that. But still, that's not what Christmas is about. Giving's a good thing. 
we as Christians should be people to give. So what it's about is the fact that God came to dwell among us. And that always, we should rejoice in. We should take joy. <coughs> Someone wrote years ago, I wish you joy, much joy, around this season. Not joys, but joy. Joy deep and strong and true. Joy inward joy. Since, 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 since Shirley Hart has reason to taste much joy where God has made all things new. Amen. I wish you joy. The joy of sins forgiven. The joy which comes from having Christ as yours. The joy of knowing after earth comes heaven. Forevermore, the Father's house divine. I wish you joy, the joy of his near presence. Though shadows fall and trials tend life's way, he is himself of joy, the changeless essence, joy ever fresh and new, joy every day. I wish you joy. Yes, something more than gladness. That quiet joy the Holy Spirit gives. The joy which even though things and days of sadness upsprings within, flows on, sustains, and lives. I hope this Christmas season you know the joy that comes from having Jesus Christ Amen. as your Lord and Savior. I hope you know the joy of His presence and His working in your lives. Would you stand with me, please? This morning I want to close with a doxology. It's found in the end of June. And there the writer says to him, who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, before all ages, now, and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Lord bless you. You're dismissed. May you know the joy.